Okay, so here's where we were last time. Um, we were doing this seemingly weird little calculation uh, where we um, consider a thin region around our curve and then think about little pieces of fluid um, and uh, how they're moving and specifically the extent to which they're moving along the curve and uh, computing uh, you know, what I called here the total flow rate um, of the fluid along the curve for no apparent reason. Why, why are we interested in that? <laughs> what an odd thing to compute. Uh, so one would imagine until you get down to the answer and realize that the answer has vector line integral in it, right? So this is a foot in the door to being able to make some sort of sense uh, in the fluids context out of what a vector line integral represents, right? Now in a forces context, we know vector line integral means work. Right, we are that that much is clear. But if, if, if our vector field represents a fluid, what in the world does a vector line integral mean? And uh, so the answer that we came up with, but you know, interpreting from this, is that it represents uh, this flow rate, right? Kind well, kind of. I mean, the, the this is, is talking about flow rate, uh, you know, volume of fluid, uh, but it's per unit area. Right? Uh, this A is that uh, sort of cross-sectional area there. So altogether then, I would restate it as, look, we had to, we had to talk about volume of fluid because that's what fluid is. Fluid comes in volumes, right? So I had to introduce this factor of area just to make the question make sense. But uh, I'm not actually really interested in the area because it's arbitrary, right? So I'm gonna divide it over here into the denominator Right and uh, interpret my result as telling me per unit area of cross section, of course. Right, and with that said, what does the line integral represent? The line integral represents the extent to which the fluid's flowing along the curve. Yeah. Okay, so that's a really important interpretation to have of vector line integrals. Uh, keep in mind, we only really have two primary, you know, if you will, uh, you know, models metaphors uh, for vector fields: there's forces and there's fluids. This is what vector line integral means in the lab. Okay. All right, so now with that in mind, um, I'm gonna introduce a uh, kind of a related idea, uh, something called circulation. Uh, in particular, this makes sense. This is defined um, only for a closed curve. So a curve that starts and ends at the same point. Right? So for example, this curve here is a closed curve because it starts and ends at this same uh, point right there, or in fact, you could view it as starting at any point, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, on a closed curve, um, this thing that we just got through talking about, this vector line integral, the extent to which the fluid is flowing along the curve, we call it circulation. And I, th I think the motivation for that should be reasonably um, reasonably satisfying because if a curve is a, oh, whoops, sorry, color change. If a curve is a closed curve, it kind of has to loop around on itself. It doesn't have to be in the shape of an actual circle, but, but the direction arrow, right, your unit tangent vector, that unit tangent vector in the process of going around literally goes exactly in a circle, right? You, you, you turn around. Uh, one time when you follow a closed curve. So if we're talking about the extent to which the fluid follows along as that curve goes, you know, makes a, makes a loop, you know, uh, its direction goes around in a circle, the extent to which the fluid follows the curve in making a circle, I think it's reasonable to call it then circulation of the fluid. All right. So that's uh, that's the term, and uh, we uh, regularly use the uh, lowercase Greek letter sigma uh, to represent it, and we'll be using that a lot uh, going forward. Okay, so uh, quick examples. Uh, in this uh, case here, I've got an oriented curve. A uh, quick reminder, uh, line integrals in the first place are only defined, vector line integrals, that is, are only defined if we're talking about an oriented curve. It's got to be oriented. Right? That's a key aspect of, uh, of what we're talking about. So if you have an oriented curve, like uh, I have drawn here, and if the vector field is doing like this, I think it's pretty believable that the circulation here 
that circulation is going to be positive. Because check it out, the fluid is literally flowing along the curve, right? As kind of as much as it possibly could, um, in some sense. Okay, on the other hand, for comparison purposes, let's look at this curve now oriented the other way. It's the same underlying curve. It's still this kind of a circle, right? Uh, same sort of circle. But this one, oriented the other way. And I emphasize, when we say that a curve is an oriented curve, that's part of fundamentally of what it is. So these two circles here, uh, this one oriented that way, and uh, this one oriented the other way, these are not the same circle. They, they, they consist of all the same points. Right, I literally copy pasted it, okay, right? um, but uh, but they have different orientations. Orientation is part of what it is. They are different as oriented curves. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this oriented curve here, then uh, it, the circulation I claim is negative, and negative here because the vector field um, it's going that way as the curve is going that way. Right, so it's it's not going along the oriented curve. It's going opposite. It's going opposed to the direction of the oriented curve. So negative seems like a reasonable conclusion there. Okay. Um, and then uh, now then there's a question here. What do we do with uh, this one here? Uh, what, what do we say about that curve? And it's oriented like that. And the problem is, is that well, in some places the 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 Fluid is going what you might call clockwise. Uh, you might say uh, not along, you know, opposite of the direction of the orientation on that curve. But in other places, the fluid is going along the curve in the direction of the orientation. So there's a more complicated story here, and we're gonna, you know, if we were to add that up over this entire curve, we'd have some pieces where it's negative and some pieces where it's positive, and uh, you got to see what you get. Right to uh, to know what the circulation is. How we doing? Yes. Is the only difference between this and the curl is that this is over? Uh, yeah, curl is the yeah, yeah curl is defined at single points, right? Um, so this is a uh, this is kind of a, uh, a globally computed kind of thing. It's circulation is computed on a curve. Yeah, curl is computed at a point. Yeah. Which I think is what you what you were asking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now there, there is a close relationship between them, as it turns out, but that's uh, yet to be identified. And you had a yeah. So when you're looking at the close, curve, are you looking at the vector field like on the outside of it? No, the the vector field where the curve is. So I mean, when you when you compute this integral, you're always evaluating the vector field at the points that you're actually on. I just drew them off to the side just for kind of visual convenience. But no, at uh, you know if we're looking, you know, at this point here, you got to look at the what the vector field is doing literally at that point. Okay. Yeah, 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 totally. All right. Okay, so I make a. Uh, a uh, an assertion here uh, about uh, you know another interpretation you you can make of circulation and let's imagine that this is a uh, tiny leaf floating uh, in a um, uh, on the surface of some water hypothetically uh, and let's suppose that this is the uh, what the water is doing the water you got a little uh, you know what would you call this a little uh, um, Hurricane, uh, you know, um, little swirling of the water. Um, what do you think the leaf's going to do? I, I, I propose that this leaf would be twisting, turning, right? Because I mean, the water is kind of pushing it that way. And in fact, if you think about it, circulation is exactly what uh, is measuring the extent to which this is happening. The extent to which. The water is going to be pushing, kind of, uh, in this case, counterclockwise uh, along that leaf, right? So circulation is a kind of an indication of which way are the. I mean, if you were to, if you have water flowing as described by your vector field, and if you just kind of sprinkle a bunch of confetti down on there, are those little pieces of confetti? Are they going to be spinning counterclockwise? Are they going to be spinning clockwise? Circulation is what will measure that for you. Okay. Alrighty. Um, 
<clears throat> yeah. Okay. So moving along. A um, couple of little incidental notes that I need to make. Uh, sometimes you get luck with the, lucky with the geometry, and these are great little opportunities. You don't want to miss, uh, uh, you know, an opportunity to take advantage of a convenience. Uh, so here is a, an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, I have a curve here. Uh, parameterized like so. Now this is a weird parameterization, I suppose. This is a spherical parameterization, but I'm giving you rho phi and theta as functions of time. And well, that tells you location as a function of time. Just, uh, you know, in spherical coordinates and you'd have to uh, compute x, y, and z from that. And if you think about that, right, how would, you know, we have formulas for x, y, and z. Whew, those would be weird, nasty formulas for X, Y, and Z. This would be horrific, um, a horrific parameterization. Uh, but uh, describing some curve, and I noticed that that curve is moving along uh, the uh, unit sphere here, because check it out, rho is always equal to 1. Okay. All right, and with that uh, noted, uh, we want to compute uh, the... Vector line integral of, uh, let's see how I'll use green, uh, this vector field. How would you do that? And I suppose you, you, know, you could plug and chug, right? We have formulas for how to compute vector fields. F dot x prime dt. Take that parameterization, plug it in. Uh, this x right here. You know, the usual formula in terms of rho, phi, and theta. This y, again, the usual formula. You can just plug it all in there. And the thing is, you get this horrific, massive, nasty, intractable integral. Okay. So, uh, don't do it that way. <laughs> the observation I want to make uh, is that uh, knowing that rho is equal to 1, uh, this curve... Um, is always on the sphere, and as a result, that means that its tangent vector, dx, keep in mind as a tangent vector, is always parallel to the sphere. So that's my first geometric observation. Um, if you're moving within a surface, your tangent, your, your velocity vector is always tangent to that surface. Okay, second observation. Let's look at the vector field. Uh, here's our vector field, and uh, it's uh, you know pointing in a certain direction. But notice, it is a multiple. It is a scalar multiple of position vector x. It's not a constant multiple, but it's a scalar multiple, right? So it depends on what x and y are. But at the same time, whatever vector field is, it's always some scalar multiple of where are you. <coughs> Right, it's a scalar multiple of position. And here's the thing about spheres. Sphere centered at the origin, that is. Position vector x is always orthogonal to the surface. Right? So that means that our vector uh, field f is always perpendicular. And so if I'm looking at a dot product then, uh, f dot dx, well, there's the f and there's the dx. Uh, one of them is parallel to the sphere. One of them is perpendicular to the sphere. That means that f and dx are always perpendicular to each other. And that means this dot product is always zero. And that means that we're adding up a bunch of zeros. And that means this integral is zero. Does that make sense to everybody? And you don't have to wade through uh, a bunch of trig unnecessarily. A um, couple of clever observations, and we're done. Okay, so you get lucky sometimes. Um, how, how should you know when to be on the lookout for this kind of thing? Uh, spheres always, I think, are kind of an eyebrow raiser, right? Um, not a promise that something's going to work out, but the symmetries of spheres are so awesome. Right, this being just one of many different kinds of cool symmetries that spheres have, uh, and uh, so there, yeah, I can't give you a a perfect always this, never that uh, sort of answer to when are you going to use these kind of arguments. But always keep uh, kind of one eye open uh, to uh, to these sorts of possibilities. Okay. Okay. Okay, this next thing is uh, is something we could spend a lot of time talking about, but we really shouldn't. Uh, it's not it's not really worth 
spending a lot of time on it. I, I'm going to present this as being basically a notational alternative. Um, it is more than that. But as far as what we're going to do with it in this course, uh, it's a notational alternative. Okay, so the the, the observation is uh, not, a, not a big one. But um, the idea is we, we already know this. dx is x prime dt. Uh, and, of course, we know what x prime is. x prime is, well, it's... You know, derivatives are computed one coordinate at a time, so x prime, y prime, z prime. Right? And then you can notice you can just kind of distribute the dt, and then you find yourself looking at expressions like that, and uh, you know, scalar x prime, that's dx dt, multiply it by dt, pretty strong motivation to want to call that dx. Right, and then likewise uh, for these others, uh, that's dy and that's dz. So altogether, then what we have is an alternative way to write the dx vector. The dx vector, you know, our position differential, our, our differential estimate of how much our location changes as we move along the curve. We can think of it in terms of coordinates: dx, dy, dz. And if you just plug that in. Right, uh, and then uh, don't forget our vector field uh, f is pqr. Uh, you can just, you know, you can just choose to crank out this dot product right here, <laughs> and it's, uh, I mean, just dot it out, and out comes that. So, I claim not really much happened here. This is just kind of fiddling with how we choose to write things, uh, but the nice punchline is I have an alternative way to write a vector line integral. Instead of writing f dot dx, you can write pdx plus qdy plus rdz. And just keep in mind, when you write it like that, these things, the p, the q, and the r, are the vector field. They're the, the, the uh, uh, components of the vector field. Okay, now, you may be thinking to yourself, oh, this is a notational alternative? Okay, well, I'm going to choose not to use it. <laughs> right? Um, vast majority of the time, I choose not to use it. Because look at your options. Which one's easier to write down? Well, I mean, this is shorter. This is more compact. Um, this thing that we have on the left, uh, I feel like in some sense it's more natural I know what that represents. That vector field, it, it either represents forces, right? Or it represents um, uh, how a fluid is flowing. It represents something physical. Uh, DX represents something kind of physical in a way. It represents, well, okay, look, I was here and now I moved over to there and my differential estimate of uh, my change in position. That's kind of, if you will, geometrically meaningful. So, this notation here is both compact and natural in that sense. Uh, whereas this over here is less compact and really arguably kind of less natural. I mean, uh, not that dy doesn't have a meaning, but just by itself, it's, it's telling you uh, how much did just your y-coordinate change, right? And that's just kind of a weird way of thinking about how you're moving. Okay. So vast majority of the time, I, do, I don't use that notation. Uh, vast majority of the time, I like that notation there. Now that said, um, you have to be aware of it for a combination of reasons. For one thing, this notation, a lot of people like it. And you're going to see it, whether you like it or not. Right? It's out there. It's going to be in your engineering textbooks, your physics textbooks, whatever. It's, it's there. And so you need to be able to make sense out of it. And I've made the observation already. If you do see something like this, just don't forget, uh, whoops, uh, P, Q, and R, what those represent is, it's just telling you what the vector field is. It's just telling you what the, what you might call your integrand is from this point of view. So you need to be able to make that connection and interpret what you see uh, appropriately. Um, the other thing is, I, I just want to recognize um, there is a point of view on vector line integrals that I'm not going to tell you all. It's too, uh, I'm going to say sophisticated. Uh, it's, it's very, 
it's very heavy. It's very it's a big machinery that has to be set up and defined and it's very abstract. And for what we're doing in this course, it's not really that helpful. It's not that big of a deal in this course. Um, in a more sophisticated take on this material, it's indispensable, right? So differential forms are fantastic. Um, we're just not going to get that far. We're not going to be covering that in, the, in in this course at all. So um, if you were to write differential forms, honestly, they look a lot like that. This basically is, a, uh, uh, as I have it written here, an integral of a differential form. Um, so uh, the people that like this notation are not crazy, right? There are good reasons to want to do it that way, even if those good reasons don't apply to us. Okay, does it all make sense? Any questions? Okay. Okay, so moving on now, uh, 6.2, we're going to talk about a new theorem called Green's Theorem. Uh, this is a, oh, my stylus isn't working well. Uh, this is a weird theorem. Uh, this is going to kind of come out of nowhere, seemingly. Uh, we're going to have to spend a little bit of time developing uh, some some tools, some machinery, a little bit. Um but uh, when we get it written down, I think it's ultimately a fairly natural result. It just it just kind of it, it seems weird uh, as we as we go through developing it. So I'm going to have to ask you to bear with me here. Um, by the way, I'll also point out this is the first of several theorems that we're going to see that are kind of like this. That uh, kind of seemingly weird. Why are we doing this? Uh, we're making we're going to make some arbitrary choices, conventions, just because we have to, to so we can kind of get things done. We have to make some choices. Um, and uh, so, so what you're about to see is the first example of a kind of a, a, a kind of a, an attack on certain kinds of questions that uh, we're going to use several times. And it's arguably, oh, I don't want to overstate it, but it's one of the most important things remaining in uh, in the course for chapters six and seven. This uh, what we're about to do is one of the biggest sort of strategies that we're going to use. Okay, so that's the the uh, intro. Let's do it. Uh, I'm going to start off by talking about what we mean by boundary. Uh, boundary means where the edge of a region is, kind of what you would expect, right? But now we're going to attach an additional idea. We're going to think of boundary going forward as being an intrinsically oriented thing. Henceforth, when you hear the word boundary, that does not mean a curve anymore. Now boundary means an oriented curve. And there is a specific orientation. Um, it, it is a convention. It is an arbitrary convention, but it's highly standard. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to adopt the standard convention to get on board with what everyone else in the world does. Um, here's, here's the rule. Um, if you have a region, D, yeah, some two-dimensional region, this is all in two dimensions, by the way, um, the rule is the orientation of the boundary curve is in the direction that as you go in that direction, you want the region whose boundary you're talking about to be on your left. Right? So you imagine as you're walking along the boundary, if you're walking around along the boundary in this direction, this purple direction, you're going that way, the region's on your left. Everybody see what I mean? Okay. So now, for this little piece of curve, that means that I'm oriented, which you might call to the right. Um, but notice that uh, looking at a different part of that region or different part of a different region, perhaps, uh, in order to move in the direction so that the region is on my left, right? if I want it to be on my left as I walk, I have to walk the other way, to the left this time, not to the right. So which is it? Well, always such that as you go, the region is on your left. That's the convention. Yes. It's like you're standing out of the page. No, I, no. Um, yes. That, yeah, that's right. So you're. That's right. So you imagine the two-dimensional region like being a flat surface that you're walking on, and you're you're walking right along that boundary. Like the boundary is a uh, is a like a uh, you know a sidewalk or something. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Yes. So that pink arrow there is basically just like a direction arrow telling us what they're walking. Yeah, it that's the the purple arrow is telling you the orientation. So keep in mind an orientation means you know for a given curve, which way is the direction that you go along that curve. That's right. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. Okay. All right, now there's a temptation to oversimplify this uh, and say, uh, oh, okay, well, if you need to go in such a way that the region is on your left, then, uh, okay, such as that, um, doesn't that mean that you're always going um, counterclockwise? Very tempting. Again, you look at a picture like this. Um, uh, removing so the regions on my left makes me go counterclockwise, and it's hard to imagine how it would be anything. I mean, change this, you know, bend this shape around however you like, still counterclockwise. Um, the reason that you can't state it this way reliably is that if you're looking at a region that has holes in it, right, and there's no reason that it couldn't. It takes longer to fill that in than I wish. Um, if you have a region like that that has holes in it, notice that in order on the boundary, these sort of what you might call inside pieces of boundary, the way that you go to have the region on your left, right, is in fact uh, clockwise, not counterclockwise. Okay, so if you want to. You know, for your own personal convenience, uh, have a, uh, you know, a simplification that says, uh, well, you know, as long as you're going along the outside part of the boundary, right, if you're on the outside part of the boundary, uh, uh, then it's all always counterclockwise. Yeah, that's fine, right? But, uh, that is an important asterisk right there that only works that way. Okay. Okay. So there's a convention. Uh, and I remind you, going forward, this word boundary, henceforth, always means oriented. And it always means oriented this way. Um, another quick uh, note, um, sort of a weird choice, but that symbol there that we usually use to mean partial derivatives, this, is, uh, this doubles as a uh, notation to represent boundaries. Uh, it's just, uh, the motivations for that aren't important, but... Uh, Henceforth, this little symbol means boundary. Okay. Okay. Now, here's another idea. Um, we've talked about a little bit in the past. We've talked about uh, accumulation. I've talked about, for example, you know, if you have mass, um, that uh, mass is an accumulating quantity. You can chop it up into little pieces, and the mass of the whole is the sum of the masses of the little pieces. Right, so I like to call this accumulation, and uh, again, it's pretty obvious when you think about it from the point of view of mass. If there is a bunch of mass in that region, the act of drawing a line here does not change the total amount of mass. Right, so yes, the area on the left side, the area on the right side, you add them up, you get the, the whole. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to I'm going to say then that mass is an accumulating quantity. Uh, or you might say that the mass uh, accumulates over the area in the sense that you can chop up the area and the whole is the sum of the parts. All right, is that all right terminology? Um, now, I want to point out that not everything has this feature. Not all quantities that you can associate to a region. So, for example, if you let's look at this region again, there's another quantity that I can associate to that region. Instead of talking about how much mass is on that region or how many people live in that region, right? Something like that. Another thing I can talk about is I can talk about the perimeter of that region. Now, let's ask the question, is perimeter... An accumulating quantity. Well, here's the thing. If I look at the left side, right, the perimeter is that distance. If I look at the right side, the perimeter is that distance. And on the other hand, if I look at the whole, the perimeter is that. And so now I, oh man, uh, 
Okay, so now we let's just ask the relevant question. Is the purple distance the sum of the dark blue distance and the dark green distance? Now, of course not. Look at that. There's this chunk in the middle here that's kind of messing things up, right? I mean, it, it, it's kind of close in the sense that purple kind of tracks blue and it tracks dark green around the edge, but there is perimeter on the pieces that is not part of the perimeter of the whole. So not everything accumulates. Perimeter here is not an accumulating quantity. Everybody see the difference? Okay. So some quantities accumulate, some quantities don't. All right, and that's tempting to say that, uh, well, yeah, that's because mass is a real thing that is neither created nor destroyed by arbitrary acts of drawing lines, whereas perimeter is made up nonsense that is basically defined by arbitrary lines. Right? <laughs> so there's temptation to say that physical things accumulate and geometric things, you know, probably not. Um, it's just not that simple, though. Um, so here is the important counterexample, boundary circulation. I claim boundary circulation actually accumulates. And this is unexpected. Boundary circulation is, uh, well, in other words, a vector line integral is a kind of manufactured, made up mathematical nonsense. It's not intrinsically a physical thing, at least not the way we've thought about it previously. But I claim that it accumulates. Let's see that happen. Let's talk about uh, what is the uh, boundary circulation around the left piece here. Well, boundary circulation on that left piece is... like that. Let's look at the right piece now. Here's the right piece of area. The uh, boundary circulation around that is like so. The boundary circulation around the hole like that is uh Blue plus green equals a purple. Well, it's kind of tempting to say it's not. Tempting to say it's not because of all the junk that's in the middle here, right? There's, there's kind of that and this left over. Right? Just like with the perimeter, there's this stuff in the middle that's left over. Here's the thing. This is not perimeter. This is vector line integral. The vector line integral over this line here. <coughs> but wait a second. But twice... But going opposite directions each time. And so this dark blue vector line integral, this dark green vector <coughs> line integral have exact, exactly the same but opposite values. They're exact negatives of each other, right? Per uh, chapter 5 discussions. Uh, 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 no, uh, uh, sorry, section 6.1 discussions. And uh, so those cancel each other. And so, indeed, boundary circulation um, accumulates. This quantity, kind of a weird thing to think about, but uh, this quantity on the whole is indeed equal to this quantity on the left piece plus this quantity on the right piece. Just like mass. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. All right. Weird. Uh, I'm going to point out further. It doesn't matter how many pieces you break it up into, right? You could you could take your region, and I I deliberately made an incomplete region here, right? As if it's you know it huge, right? Something like that. But just uh, you can see as you slice it up, any little little edge here that is created in the inside as you sort of slice and dice as much as you want. Well, that edge as part of the boundary of the left piece. The orientation is going to be that way. As part of the boundary of the right piece, the orientation is going to be that way. These are opposite orientations on the same curve. The values are negatives of each other. They cancel in the summation. So all of these interior edges then, when you add up the, the terms corresponding to these interior pieces, they all go away. Because... Uh, on any given edge, the arrows always point opposite directions. So slice and dice as much as you want. Vector line integral 
boundary vector line integral, circulation, in other words, accumulates. Okay. All right, now there's a weird consequence of this, and this is a little creepy, but I think this is an important point of view. Um, here's a uh, quick picture of uh, what a circulation looks like, you might say. Uh, boundary circulation on uh, this kidney bean, uh, I don't know, lima bean, whatever that is, looking thing. Um, and I'm going to ask the question now, where? is the circulation. And it's tempting to say, well, I see it. It's in purple. The, the circulation, it happens on the perimeter. And I point out, uh, well, that's one way to think about it. But you could, if you wanted to, think about it in a very different way. You could think about it as actually coming from the interior. Because that purple circulation, which, uh, by the way, if you uh, look at the way I have this set up, that purple circulation is 33. Um, it is, though, uh, this green circulation, which is 7, uh, plus this blue circulation, uh, which is 6, uh, plus blah, blah, blah. Right? So this purple thing uh, is just what you get when you add up stuff that's actually in the interior, all these little pieces in the interior. And the only reason I didn't make these pieces smaller is because then it would be even harder to read what it has on the inside. Right? So um, when you say that the purple circulation of 33 uh, is on the perimeter, I would come back and say, no, nah, not really. Seven of that 33 is actually in this green region. And six of that 33 is actually in this blue region. And four is in this region up here. And that 33 that you measured on the boundary, it's actually distributed over the inside. You could choose to think of it that way. And again, you don't have to, but you could. It's not, uh, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with thinking about it that way. And this is going to be a really important way to think about it. Okay, so weirdly, uh, and this works for any accumulating quantity, um, but uh, uh, boundary circulation, I want to think of as being distributed over the interior. You measure it on the boundary, it actually exists in the interior. Okay. Okay, so yeah, and uh, so uh, said differently, um, uh, that means it's kind of like mass in that way. Right? It's something that I can associate to a region that, that accumulates in the same way that mass does. So I'm going to say that boundary circulation, you should think of it as being kind of stuff-like. It's almost, it's almost like it's a physical thing. It's not, but it, it's as if it is. It behaves like it is. Okay. All right. And with that in mind, let me just remind you, we have this notion of mass density. Right, mass density. Where you take uh, some little little region and uh, mass per unit area is uh, is what we call mass density. Or said differently, um, it's uh, it's the thing that you multiply by area to get mass. And, and take your take your breath. Well, if circulation actually behaves like mass, then we can kind of do the same thing with circulation. And so what I'm going to claim, uh, I'm going to claim that there is this notion uh, called circulation density. It's a little bit of a weird thought. Uh, the idea of circulation density, though, is you take the amount of circulation that there is on your piece. So you look at circulation around the boundary of whatever little piece you're looking at. The amount of that circulation... Uh, per unit area, right? So then you divide by that little area, right? And remember, we were talking about uh, circulation that you see on the boundary as actually literally being distributed throughout the interior, right? Well, it's going to be distributed in uh, an irregular way. There might be more in some pieces and less in some pieces. And it depends on kind of where you are. How much of it is where is defined by this density, how much circulation per unit area that you're looking at. That is area that you're circulating around. So that's the idea. We call that circulation density. Yes? 
I'm still a little bit confused about it being like spread out. Did you look at the yeah. other picture? Mm -hmm. the middle one just cancel out with the um, circulation of the Well, on this edge, yes. Yeah. Right? Um, so on that edge, you're right. That piece of line integral and that piece of line integral do indeed cancel each other, right? Mm -hmm. But what remains then, the, the whole point to that observation is that that means that that circulation plus that circulation plus that circulation, et cetera, if I, if I were to consider these circulations, compute them separately, right? And while I'm computing this green circulation, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in the orange or the blue. While I'm computing this green circulation, I'm just computing it. It, it is what it is, and it's six, as it turns out. Um, this cancellation observation that you pointed to is why the sum of these nine terms gives you the circulation on the whole. That's, that's why the summation works, right? But the fact that the summation works, it remains as a kind of a separate, uh, separate point. Okay, so the interior ones yeah. are kind of just like canceling ones that make it sidereal. Yeah, I mean, look, you're right. In some sense, every term in this green, you know, when you actually write down the summation, right, all the, all the terms in green do cancel, but that doesn't mean there's no circulation. The circulation is literally what it is. Right? It's just the fact that they cancel is why this summation gives you only the perimeter. Okay. Right? But the green circulation still is what it is. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So I'm I'm just a little bit confused on why exactly they cancel and that's because like yeah. if all of those different regions have like different circulations. Yes. Like like all those vectors on the edges, yes. how can we say that they're all the same size and that they fully cancel each other? Uh, so I'm not claiming that this and this cancel. They don't. Mm -hmm. What I'm claiming is that the term corresponding to this edge, right? If when I look at this at this circulation on the left, when I look at that blue circulation, one of the terms is going uh, upward along that orange piece, right? And when I look at this green circulation, right, one of the terms is going downward on that orange piece. That's all I'm claiming cancel. Right, so so this little piece of the of blue and this little piece of green, those cancel, and that's why the summation makes all the interior terms disappear. Does that does that make sense? Kind of, but how do we know that those two arrows are the same size? That they're because they're moving along literally along the same curve. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, because that's I mean, this is when you chop it up. I mean, you're chopping up your region into pieces. And the shared edge has got to be well defined. Yeah, so it's the same length on both sides. It's literally the same curve. It's just not the same oriented curve. Okay. Yeah, yes. So why does it not matter that they have different magnitudes? The, the, uh, like the, the one on the left has seven, the one on the right has six. Oh, that, that, it's, it's, I mean, this one, this one over here is seven because of, uh, the other terms of these other edges. Uh, I mean, they th that calculation there and this calculation here. There's a lot that they don't share, right? I'm just saying. Well, if you focus on just this one edge here, on that edge, you know, the terms, the orange part associated to just this one little piece of curve, and the green part associated to just that little piece of curve. Those, are, that's what cancels. Yeah. Yes. How come the like top part of the middle one doesn't cancel with the bottom part, and like the left and right don't? Going opposite and they have oh no! They yeah, all the interior edges can't. I just focused on this one just to save time. No, I mean like the um, top one of the middle one and the bottom one of the middle one. Because aren't they the same magnitude going different directions? It, uh, yeah, they're going the the middle one. Like, I'm not. The middle piece. If you, it's like this piece right here. Yeah. Okay. So the top edge of that rectangle and the bottom edge of that rectangle. Oh uh, well, because the vector fields are different. Right, the, the the value of the vector field up here is uh, totally unrelated to the value of the vector field here. So yeah, so there are different pieces of curve. They happen to be the same length, but the value of the vector field depends on okay. the length of the curve, the what the vector field is doing, and how those multiply and how those add up. Yeah, so those, they're just different. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're almost to Green's theorem. Um, we've got this idea of circulation. Claim circulation is an accumulating quantity. It behaves kind of like mass, and in the sense that it behaves like mass, you can talk about a density for it, and kind of in the same way you talk about mass density. 
By the way, we call this mass density because the numerator is literally mass. And so likewise, we call this circulation density because the numerator is literally circulation. Right, so that's the that's the term. Kind of like with population density, right? When you talk about population density, you're not talking about how dense is the population, right? It's it's a it's a quantity of interest per unit size. So here, the quantity of interest is circulation. All right, um, this um, this thing, this circulation density, circulation per unit area, can be computed with a formula. And here it is. It's dq dx minus dp dy. Uh, I'm not going to do the calculations to derive that in this class. Um, it's in the book if you're curious. It has some uh, details, and it's uh, I suppose it's an interesting uh, computation, and you can uh, look at it if you're curious. But um, for what we're doing in class, I'm going to just uh, assert that this is the result. I think it's I think it's more important to understand how to interpret this as circulation density, right, to, to, to kind of get what that means, than it is to know how to derive the formula, which is uh, details. Okay. All right, so it's a very important quantity. Um, I like to call it Green's operator because it's the major player in Green's theorem that we're about to state. Um, as notations, I mean, there's various different notations for how you can write this down. Uh, <laughs> I have, you know, some are... Uh, some I like more than others. Uh, some other people like more than others. Um, to my knowledge, I think I may have made this one up. Um, but it makes great sense to me. It's Green's operator, so green. I don't know. That's my thought process. It, that's just how I think about it. Um, some people call it rot of F, R-O-T for rotation. Um, and you can kind of see that because, again, it's kind of telling you how the fluid is rotating in a way, right? This uh, The circulation aspect of what's going on there. So I think rote kind of makes sense. Um, it's also sometimes called curl, which, I'm, which I know you've heard of before. Um, I don't personally like to call it curl because curl, as we've defined it in this class, is a three-dimensional for three-dimensional vector fields. And itself is a vector field. This is a scalar. right? So very importantly, the way you understand how circulation works, that in two dimensions versus three dimensions, they're just really different uh, in, in, in important ways. And they have a lot in common. Yes, of course, obviously. Uh, but they also have a lot of differences. So um, to me, two-dimensional curl and three-dimensional curl, if, if only for the fact that the formulas are so different. Um, I don't uh, personally uh, like to call it curl, but I think our textbook does, and uh, a lot of other uh, contexts you'll see curl as well. <coughs> and then you'll also see it written like that. Now, this is weird to me. I don't like this at all. We're in two dimensions. There is no del cross. There is no cross in two dimensions. right? So what they're saying when they write this is, let's pretend we were in three dimensions. Let's do del cross as if we were in three dimensions, and then recognize, oh yeah, but really all I want is the third component of that, which you might recognize from the curl formula. And uh, so then they say dot k. It, it's <laughs> it's not uh, it's not convenient. It's not compact, and it's also a little sketchy. So I think this is weird. I don't care for this notation at all. Um, I hope you won't use that one. Okay, now here's where it all comes together. Circulation we defined as being uh, what a you know vector line integral around a boundary curve. So uh, th this first part of the of the uh, of this line of, of work here uh, is just a restatement that uh, this thing, this formula, we view as being a quantity called circulation. Um, circulation is an accumulating quantity. So this is a huge part of, this is a very big step right here. Total circulation around the boundary of the whole, we can view as being a summation of little pieces of circulation that you add up over all the little pieces that you chop up the area into. Just an This is just the accumulation observation. And then we have this idea of density, that circulation per unit area can be understood with, uh, with this notion of circulation density here. 
Um, and uh, I've used the uh, GRN notation here to represent that density. And uh, lo and behold, then, uh, notice that with these three ideas, right, viewing circulation as a quantity, recognizing that it has the feature of accumulation, recognizing that there's an associated density, gives us this uh, very surprising result called Green's Theorem, um, that if you're interested in a boundary line integral, you can compute that instead as a double integral over the interior of this thing called Green's operator. So there's Green's Theorem. Again, I, 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 I believe I sold this correctly as it's a weird result that's going to come out of nowhere after a lot of setup. <laughs> right? So that's what happened. Um, but uh, it's a, a, a very powerful theorem. We'll see uh, applications of this later on. Have a good one. Okay. Oh, and sticker.